The children's church thing threw me off completely. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, okay, it's me. Hi, good morning. So, um, there was a, a, a flood as a rain starts coming down and there's a man there and he's sitting on his porch and he watches it rain and he says, you know, uh, people drive up and they say, hey, get in the car. There's a flood coming. You got to go. We got to get out of here. And he says, no, the Lord will provide. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. So the car drives off and the flood waters, they keep rising up. And now, you know, it's about three, four feet high. And he's sitting, he's sitting um, up high on the porch. He's standing on the railing and a boat comes by. And they say, get in the boat, get in the boat. Come on, there's floods, waters are rising. We got to get out of here. And he says, no, the Lord will provide. I'll be all right. It's going to be fine. The, the Lord's going to take care of me. So the boat takes off. So now he's on the roof. Flood waters are really high. A helicopter flies overhead. And they're yelling to him, hey, come on, you got to get on the helicopter. The flood waters are rising. You're going to die. You can't stay here. And he says, no, no, the Lord's going to provide. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. So he dies. And he goes to heaven and he says, God, what happened? I, I counted on you. I, I, I thought you were going to save me. And God said, I sent you a car, a boat, and a helicopter. So sometimes <laughs> we find ourselves in a bad spot. We find our faith being tested. And uh, we feel as though, you know, it's going to be dashed on hardships. We feel as it's going to be uh, crushed uh, on, on the rocks of, of our life and the troubles that we have. Paul had his fair bit of hardships as well. A lot of times we say, you know, why me? Why can't I have nice stuff? I'm a good Christian. I go to church. Why, you know, how come this isn't happening to Kim Jong-il instead, right? Or Un, sorry, Kim Jong-il, it already happened to him. So, um, <laughs> you know, and we wonder why, you know, how come bad things happen to me when I'm a good Christian and I don't, I don't understand you know, why this stuff happens. And, you know, it could be something serious. It could be a medical emergency, or it could be something very um, minor, like a car accident, a fender bender. And you're like, ah, oh, I can't have nice things. You know, um, my mother-in-law, who's here at church today, she had to take a quick little visit to the hospital yesterday, and, and she's fine now, but we had her dog. And so uh, her dog kind of made a mess on some, some clothes today. And uh, so before I left, I had to go put it in the wash. And I wasn't sure what cycle, and I figured heavy duty. So, uh, but can, you know, we had just cleaned the rug. We're like, ah, oh, man, all right. So anyway, <laughs> why do we suffer? Well, I have a few ideas, and, and you may disagree. But one, we live in a cursed planet. We suffer because this planet is not perfect. Uh, we had sin came into it. God, God made it perfect, right? But sin came. And after that, it was no longer perfect, and it was cursed. Um, we're travelers in this world. It's not our home. In 2 Corinthians, it says that we know that our earthly house, it's, this tent is destroyed. So he doesn't even really calling it a house. He calls it a tent, which is very impermanent. Um, it's, uh, you know, and he says, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but internal in heaven. And uh, in Hebrews 13, 14, it says, um, we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So this place is very temporary. And yeah, there's suffering here. Um, but that's why, because this isn't our home. And I don't think we should want it to be our home. We should not want to stay here. We should want to look forward to what's next. Another reason we've all sinned and fallen short. Um, some sins, we do have immediate consequences, right? And some don't. Some have a long-term consequence. Sometimes we may sin and do something wrong and nothing happens for a while and everything seems fine. And then later there might be a consequence from that sin that we didn't expect. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that is what causes our suffering. Sometimes, you know, we might choose to um, choose to speed, right? We might uh, choose to do something dangerous, and then th that results in an immediate consequence. Um, you know, we make those bad decisions. We choose to live in a dangerous place, right? We might live on a floodplain, 
or we might live on um, a hurricane zone or a tornado alley. And sometimes we suffer because of where we decided to live. It just has a higher, higher risk to us. Um, we choose not to take care of ourselves. You know, I could listen to this one more. You know, um, we, we choose what we eat and sometimes we choose bad things, uh, choose to smoke, choose to drink, choose to do drugs. And sometimes consequences happen from that. Uh, you know, we choose to sin and sin often brings bad consequences. And that's what we're warned about. And that's why we're warned about sin. Other people make bad decisions. You know, um, God gave us free will. And one of the things that is frustrating about that sometimes is if somebody chooses to drink and then get in a car and drive, they may hit somebody and kill them. And that's a consequence of their free will. Um, and you, ha you may have had nothing to do with it, but you're the one suffering the consequence of somebody else's bad decisions. And um, again, that's all part of this, this world that we really uh, know is temporary. So what did Paul do? Well, Paul, as Saul, he persecuted the church and he was pretty well respected, right? He was pretty powerful. People heard about him and they, were, they, they stepped back. Um, later, he preached the gospel and he was beaten and he was thrown in prison. Paul, um, he endured and he suffered much. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11, five times he received 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Once he was pelted with stones. Three shipwrecks. He spent the night and the day in the open sea. In danger from rivers. He said he was in danger from bandits. In danger from fellow Jews. In danger from Gentiles. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Labored and toiled, and he often went without sleep. He hungered and he thirsted. He often went without food. He was cold and naked. Besides everything else, he said that he was always concerned for the churches, and he faced that pressure constantly. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, one of these incidents when he was in the sea. Paul was a prisoner. Um, he was a prisoner and he was, um, being tried, I believe it was, you know, preaching the gospel and he asserted his right as a Roman. And he said, you know, I want to be tried in Rome. So he set sail for Rome and, um, he, he, um, he leaves from that place, however you pronounce it. I don't think I'm going to try, but he leaves from there. And then um, he goes to Lycia, and they find a ship heading for Italy, and he's put aboard that ship. Uh, they have a really difficult journey. They come to a uh, city or a town called Fair Havens, and Paul warns them, right? He says, uh, much time has been lost. Hold on. Ah, here we go. Acts 27, verse 9. He says, much time has been lost. And sailing has already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. So Paul might suffer some suffering as a consequence of people not listening to him and their actions. So the storm whips up as they're traveling. Um, they need to secure the lifeboat because it's, it's, they're afraid they're going to lose it. They actually have to pass ropes under the ship to hold the ship together, to keep it from falling apart. They lower the anchor because they're hoping to try to slow themselves down from, from being tossed in the... Um, uh, the wind and the waves, and then they throw their cargo overboard. They gave up hope. So this is a disaster for them. Paul encourages them. He says, um, well, he does, he does a brief, I told you so. So it's part of his encouragement. Um, in Acts 27, you know, this is the problem when you start getting older um i have a bible with very small print 
and it's getting I read on my phone a lot and it's getting to the point where I can barely read this so um, after the men had gone a long time without food Paul stood up before them and said men you should have taken my advice and not sailed from Crete then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed last night an angel of God of the God who I serve stood beside me and said do not be afraid Paul you must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you so keep up your courage men for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me let nevertheless we must run aground on some island so he urges them to keep up their courage and he says nobody's gonna no one's gonna die we're all gonna be alive and I believe there's I, I, I read it and then I can't remember where I read it. I believe there was about 270 ish people on board and he says, nobody is going to die. So, um, some men are attempting to escape, right? And what they're saying is they're like, uh, you know, they say, um, we're gonna, we're gonna lower some anchors and, and put them down in the sea, but they're not, they're actually trying to lower the lifeboat. And, um, Paul says, listen, unless everybody stays in this ship, we're not going to live. So they actually cut the lifeboat rope and they let it go free. Okay. So um, the soldiers cut the lifeboat away. So, you know, my uh, notes could be better. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so now they have no lifeboat. Now they're kind of on their own. Right now they're really on their own. They were on their own before, but their last bit of hope that they had, they, they just cut that away. So then Paul urges them to eat. They haven't eaten in 14 days. So um, Paul says, listen, for the last 14 days, you have been in constant suspense and you've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to eat. They were all encouraged and had some food. All together, here it is, there are 276 people on board. When they had eaten as much as they could, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. So, you know, as things get more dire, they start doing things that require more faith, right? So first, you know, they, in the very beginning, they threw some cargo overboard. Then they cut the lifeboat away. Now, they ate and they just threw all the food overboard because they're trying to lighten up the ship. But it also shows, you know, that that's some faith. They just dumped all their food in there and they're listening to Paul now. They're completely, they're completely in and trusting in his God. So he, he reasserts to them that no one's going to lose a hair on their head. He gives thanks and then they go. So now they, they think they see a beach ahead. <laughs> Um, they cut the acres and they untie the rudder. So now they're, they're again, goes to more faith. They are a, completely adrift at sea, completely at the whims of, of the sea, right? They're, they untie those rudders, they cut the acres, they're just going. Oh, and they hoist the sail to let the wind take them. Um, so they think they're going to make for the beach, but the ship hits a, sand, a sandbar. It's run aground. And the stern of the ship breaks, just as Paul said. He said, this ship's not going to make it. Um, so they're all trying to escape. And the centurion says, you know, um, sorry, the soldiers say that they want to kill all the, all the prisoners because they don't want them to escape. So we're just going to kill them all. Well, the centurion, um, he wants to save Paul. So he basically says um, in uh, verse uh, 43, the, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and he kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. Land. The rest were to get there on planks or other pieces of the ship. And this way, everybody reached land safely. So um, because of Paul, the centurion saved all the prisoners' lives. Um, so now they're on shore. Paul, he's going to start a fire. 
He starts a fire and he's immediately, because of the heat from the fire, a viper comes out of the wood, bites Paul. Um, and they're, all the natives are here now and they see what's going on and they expect Paul is going to die in any minute. Um, he's fine. And he gains favor with the natives. They actually think he might be a god. Um, so uh, then um, the uh, chief official of the island, his name is... Um, Flubus? Um, we're going to go with that. Publis? We'll go with Publis. Um, so he's the chief of the island, and uh, he welcomes them, and he says, you know, my father is sick, and uh, Paul heals him. And then as Paul heals him, all the other islanders realize, hey, you know, um, he just healed this guy, and everybody comes to be healed. So Paul heals a whole bunch of people. Um, so after he heals all these people, they are treated hospitably. They're given whatever they need. Um, and uh, after about three months, they get another boat and they set sail for Rome again. Um, so in Rome, Paul gets there. He finds out he's not going to be charged. He never really was going to be charged. They're like, yeah, we didn't even know there was a charge against you. So, you know. He makes this trip, finds out there's no real charge against him, but the, the Jews that are there and some of the leaders, they say, you know, we've heard about this, this Christianity sect, though. So um, we want to hear what it's all about from you. So Paul preaches, which is one of the, one of the things he does really well, right? So um, he, he preaches to them. He gives them the whole story from the Old Testament right through the New about Jesus and the good news of Jesus. Um, he proclaims the kingdom of God. And he stays in Rome for two years. And he preaches about Jesus with boldness and without hindrance. So for two years, Paul is just able to preach. There's no persecution of him at this time. And um, he shares the gospel with a lot of people. He says that um, uh, some of them believed and some didn't. But uh, the word was preached, right? So, you know, suffering... And in Paul's case, and in, in, uh, for us as well, you know, suffering can sometimes bring out our best. Uh, in the centurion, the centurion saw how Paul handled suffering, right? And um, he wanted to save Paul, and, and that led to all the prisoners being saved. Um, some of us bring food to people who are suffering, right? I know when I had my issues, people brought food all the time. Right. And so it allows people to to bring out their best and to share with with others and to be to be helpful and um, uh, to give. Suffering helps us sympathize, sympathize with other people. Right. So, um, you know, I have a, a friend at work who needs a kidney and he calls me every once in a while and we talk and I encourage him and I uh, talk about, you know, what to expect and, and the things that he's going through. And if honestly, if I didn't have my experience, I could not comfort him. There's just no way I could, right? Um, so suffering sometimes helps us help other people because we know what they're going through. Um, I, I've had people who, you know, lost a parent or a sibling and I can encourage them and I can talk to them and kind of share a little bit because I understand what they're going through. Um, it helps us encourage people. I've seen my mother encourage people. Um, because she's gone through some stuff. And, uh, you know, so that suffering um, can help us empathize, empathize with people. Um, suffering could be a good example to others. I, I don't know, I probably have said this before, but, you know, I've had somebody at work say to me, how can you still be a Christian out of everything that's happened to you? And I'm like, how could I not? Like, it's, God is amazing, and he works incredibly, and if I didn't have anything happen to me, I may, I would, I, wouldn't really realize it to the extent that I do. Um, our faith through suffering can help build other people's faith. Uh, other people can see how we we handle things, and they could and they could grow from that. Um, again, not to pick on my mom, but I've I've heard people tell me that she encourages them, and the way she she handled herself during those years was encouraging to other people. So our faith can help other people the the way we handle it. 
You know, if Paul was just running around that ship screaming in circles, right? That wouldn't have encouraged anybody. It wouldn't have helped anyone come to God. But the way he handled himself, his confidence, his faith, helped encourage other people's faith. Um, suffering makes us dependent on God, right? Cut the lifeboat. Suffering makes us say, you know, God, this is all in your hands right now. And, and um, it helps us to, to, to let go of all that. I can do this myself. Oh, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it work. Eh, you, you're not, you know. And at some point, you realize that. When they were on that ship, they realized that, you know what? We have no control of this situation. And they just let God handle it. And, and that's some, something that suffering can bring out for people. And it could help them realize that, you know what? You were never really in control. God's always been in control. Um, it helps us pray. I don't know about you. I, everybody here has gone through stuff. And if you think about the times you prayed really earnestly and really um, uh, sincerely, I'm sure you were in some kind of pain and some kind of suffering or somebody else was, right? When everything is good, it's like, okay, we'll do oh God, thank you for the food. And you just move on, right? Uh, a lot of times people don't, they just go through some motions. Sometimes we're at church and we go through motions. But when there's an issue going on in your life, you focus, right? It, it focuses you. So, you know, we go through trials and we go through suffering. And wouldn't you rather go through it with God on your side? You're going to go through it regardless, with or without him. Um, and, you know, you, you have to realize that with Paul, that, that suffering that he went through, it saved prisoners. It provided the word to all those people on the island of Malta provided the word to people in Rome, allowed him to preach for two years in Rome. He didn't suffer for no reason, right? He went through all of that and he got a, a reward at the end of that, right? He got to preach the word and God's message was able to spread because of what he went through. So, you know, you can let trials put your faith on the rocks, right? Or you can build your faith on the rocks. So if anybody wants to, you're gonna, if you're going to suffer anyway, if anybody wants to suffer with God, we have a baptistry. Water is, I don't know, probably maybe warm. It's at least room temperature, right? <laughs> so, you know, you're welcome to come on up and, and uh, join that family. Thank you. Thank you.